for Senator Yellen. Um, obviously, the House is debating on Capitol Hill right now. Um, you and your chamber specifically removed the um, emergency clause uh, because of concerns that were raised by people who wanted to ensure a referendum option existed. The House added language that, while not an emergency clause, has the same effect. It prevents a referendum. So is that, do you have the votes for that in your chamber? Do you anticipate it hitting a little bit of a, a bump when it comes back over because of that language? Yeah, so first, thank you, and I know you all want to get back to the House, but I just wanted to just make one quick comment in, before I answer that question. Just, we're in uh, the final few days of a momentous session. Um, we're on the verge of providing uh, advancements and support and a recovery that works for everyone, uh, for the people of Washington State, for families and children and businesses, with advancements in childcare, historic investments in childcare, tax reform, the Working Families Tax Credit, support for tenants and landlords, um, advancements in, for, in racial justice and police reform, behavioral health and substance abuse counseling, investments, cascade care, um, K-12, broadband, uh, incredibly exciting step forward for the state of Washington and the people of Washington State. Um, so uh, we are uh, excited to take the last few steps here to get to the finish line Capital gains is certainly a part of that. So to answer your question, uh, we will look at the bill as it comes out of the House, assuming it comes out today as we expect. And then we will caucus with our members to see if we have the votes uh, to concur with any changes they've made. As you said, they did not add back an emergency clause. Um, there is another provision about being necessary uh, for the operation of state government, which it is. Uh, and whether uh, we end up concurring or uh, taking some other path, we'll have to wait and see after we uh, have our uh, caucus, our discussion with our caucus. Rachel, do you have a follow? -up? I guess I would just ask where you personally stand on that issue. Uh, I mean, do you think uh, that you support it without uh, the option for referendum? Well, look, you know, people are going to have an opportunity to weigh in, whether it's through referendum or whether through through uh, initiative. Uh, I think that if the question is, did, is this necessary for the operation of state government? Absolutely. These funds are being used for uh, to lower taxes in the working families tax credit and to increase access to child to affordable child care for children and families and employers and employees, workers in the state of Washington. So, um, that provision, I think it meets that test. Whether we end up concurring or not, uh, I will have an answer. Uh, we will have a definitive answer in the next few days. I guarantee that. All right, next we'll go to Joe Sullivan with the Seattle Times. Joe, go ahead. Yeah, the House stripped out uh, the money going to the Working Families Tax Exemption. It's all going to the education, education Legacy account. And the won't, the state won't collecting won't start collecting that tax until like 2023. So how can you make the argument that that is necessary for government uh, here right now? Well, the working families tax credit will be ongoing. Uh, there was actually some discussion of whether uh, it was going to be something that had to be subject to appropriation or not. It's going to be ongoing, so it's something that's in the outlook uh, for the four years and beyond. Uh, and uh, so that is absolutely something that will continue regardless of when uh, the actual uh, money starts coming in from this one source. We do have uh, the luxury of having some additional uh, federal funds at this time, which makes our short-term uh, funding uh, issue a little less dire, and that allows us to provide a bridge until additional funding can come in. And I do want to make sure that it's clear that the money goes into the Education Legacy Trust account Early learning and child care are absolutely allowable uses from that account, so that connection is strong. Do you have a follow? Sure. So we usually see emergency clauses, but now we're putting language just uh, into bills. Do you do you consider this a, a viable and okay expansion of, of that uh, sort of practice? I don't think so. it's in the state constitution, which has been around for uh, since 1889. So I don't think it's a new Anything, yeah. Rich Smith with the stranger. Rich, go ahead. Hey, uh, so to talking to some members in the House, they said they might land um, 
on a compromise decision over there on the Blake decision by uh, reducing the penalty uh, for simple possession to uh, a simple misdemeanor rather than a gross misdemeanor. Uh, how do you uh, how do you feel about that sort of uh, as a compromise position? So I'll I'll just take that. Um, yeah. You know, a lot of a lot, unfortunately, a lot of the electives I'm not sure really are focused on what the penalties for gross misdemeanor versus misdemeanor are. I think the one thing that was very clear, regardless of party affiliation or what chamber you're in, is that a lot of people want to prioritize treatment and access to treatment. Um, the point of disagreement. Um, that I see is how you access that treatment, whether it's through the criminal justice system or through a non-law enforcement uh, system. But the penalty on whether it's a gross misdemeanor or misdemeanor to me is not the um, not necessarily the the big issue here. People want access to treatment; they want some accountability uh, for accessing that treatment. So, um, so I think that is a. Um, Proposal in the House, and I think we're going to have to check and see where our members in the Senate are on that. Rich, do you have a follow? Uh, I'm trying to understand. So when you say, so you're saying that it's not um, a matter of about whether or not it should be a simple misdemeanor or a gross misdemeanor, but whether how they access treatment. Could you just um, clarify that what that sticking sure. point is for me? Sorry. Sure, not a problem. So even in the Senate, when we were working on the bill, uh, a lot of it was referral to treatment, right? People were okay with that, they wanted that. Uh, then there was the option of, okay, after you have multiple referrals to treatment, you end up in the criminal justice system, should that be a felony, gross misdemeanor, misdemeanor. And while that is an important component of the bill, um, my point was that I'm not sure that the members are that um, fixated on the difference between a gross misdemeanor and the misdemeanor. Oh. A lot of the areas that people really are focused on is how you get that access to treatment. And what is that accountability method of making sure people stay in treatment? And um, so, so I think from the Senate perspective, that is a lot more where the focus is. But of course, we're going to have to talk to our members once the House ends up passing uh, a bill to say, see where, where we're at. Okay. Good, Rich? Uh, sure. Do I, uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll uh, yes. All right. Um, great. Uh, next, we'll go to Sarah Gensler with McClatchy. Sarah, go ahead. All right. On the Blake decision bill, again, the latest striker includes the sort of Sunset a little bit like the Peterson striker did, um, but to a civil infraction after the sunset. I I'm just curious how um, how that worked when the striker came out of the Senate. If there were certain kind of non-negotiables that had to be met, compromised in order for there to be a um, majority to pass that, and sort of if you think that the House bill in its current form would make it out of the Senate or get approval from the Senate. Yeah, I, I can just say, I, I think, you know, we'll look at what comes out of the Senate and, uh, you know, evaluate. I, I was really grateful on this bill. We had bipartisan support in the Senate. Uh, we had a lot of really good discussion within our caucus, uh, a lot of uh, good discussion across the aisle. You know, I think there's a spirit throughout the legislature to try to get a responsible solution on Blake. Um, so I don't know that I would say at this point that I know of a certain uh, non-negotiable line, but um, I feel it's a really important issue. It's a difficult issue, um, but I have some optimism based on the work that we did on the way, uh, on the, when the bill was in the Senate, that we have some ability to work together to get to this responsible solution. I think you're also gonna see a lot of support uh, for treatment and, and that also is going to uh, not only make it easier to, for people to get comfortable, I think with whatever the policy is, um, but it's also going to make it work better and actually help people and, and make our communities safer. Sarah, do you have a follow? Yes, a follow on the capital gains questions from earlier. Uh, is it your understanding that the language we've referred to, that, that sort of necessary language, would prevent a referendum? Or is there another way to interpret that language in its addition to the bill? I, I have to go back and look at it. My understanding was that that the Constitution does provide multiple paths 
um, for uh, you know stating something as being essential, and that there are different um, uh, provisions that come with that, or different consequences on an emergency clause. Um, I think you avoid a referendum, but the, the other reason people use a, a, an emergency clause or what you know, let's, the legislature uses an emergency clause is that um, it needs to be implemented immediately. So for instance, on the Blake bill, I, I believe there's still an emergency clause on that. The reason is because right now there is no statewide policy uh, on drug possession. So we wanted to have an emergency clause so it starts right away. So depending on the different clauses and the different paths, there are different consequences. Uh, and uh, I'll look at that, whatever passes out of the house, we'll look closely at it. We'll caucus on it and then we'll, we'll make decisions. Okay, up next, we're gonna go to Brandon Block with the Olympian. Brandon, go ahead. Hey, uh, my question is about the eviction moratorium. Um, the Senate voted on Monday to concur with a House amendment that would declare it to be over on June 30. Um, do you think that it should be over on June 30? And do you think that sufficient protections are in place to uh, avert mass evictions uh, on that day? You know, I'm really grateful to Senator Cooter and Representative Macri uh, Senator Robinson and, and really everybody that has worked is really hard to come up with with terrific uh, 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 policy and Senator Rolfus uh, uh, on the budget to make sure that the resources are there that we have a responsible exit from the moratorium. It does need to end at some point, and we want to make sure that the resources are there, uh, both in terms of of assistance, technical assistance, so people can apply for 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 the for the uh, uh, rent support, um, but also the, the legal framework to help tenants and landlords to be successful when the eviction moratorium ends. This is about helping our, our neighbors and our friends and our families to, be, to stay in their homes, but it's also this larger policy uh, importance to make sure that we don't have a wave of homelessness and we've got to get it right. Uh, I think, you know, based on the work that I've been involved in, that the uh, structures and the resources that we'll have in the budget and in the two big housing policy bills are going to help make the eviction moratorium uh, be a gradual easing off rather than a cliff. And um, I think, you know, hopefully we can hold to the, to the date that's, that's there and uh, we can make it successful for everybody in Washington State. And I'll just add to that, that I mean, I think it's also very important that we are pushing forward reforms around uh, tenant and landlord protections with the just cause legislation, as well as, well as right to counsel, which is fundamental um, to be able to shift uh, and make sure that people when they're in their most dire situation um, are, are able to have right to counsel to help them through that process. Um, to make sure that um, they are able to um, have and keep their home. And I think the other pieces, although you know, we don't have the details yet of the operating budgets and the capital budgets is you know, deep in uh, commitment um, both to rental assistance, but also to um, how we can get people into rapid housing, um, funding um, housing um, for the housing first type models, as well as ability to acquire um, hotels and other buildings to be able to uh, make sure that we are taking this opportunity um, to make sure that we create um, affordability um, and housing options for all kinds of folks um, here in Washington. Brandon, do you have a follow up? Um, just any. Uh... So we have heard from the Office of Civil Legal Aid that it could be until the fall, until they're going to be fully staffed up with uh, those lawyers to, to serve that right. Um, so can you address the sort of, what do we do in the in-between? Yeah, I, I think we're still, I mean, I think we're still, we're working through that. And I think the governor will certainly take that to, into account when, as he decides what next steps uh, that he's going to do, but that is a concern. Um, you know, that the right to counsel is extremely important, but it's not the only uh, safety provision that we have. We have lots of other resources and provisions as well. Um, so we do have some time before the eviction moratorium ends to try to make sure that we do this really responsibly. All right, up next we'll go to Laurel Dunkovich with the Spokesman Review. Laurel, go ahead. 
Uh, thanks, Aaron. Uh, Senator Bell, you kind of touched on this already, but in the capital gains debate last night, there was some concern that because the money is only going into the education trust fund, that there's not necessarily a guarantee it will go to child care, which you've all obviously said that it um, should go to. So can you, I guess, talk about how you can, I guess, guarantee that that money will end up going to this child care that you all have said is so necessary and that the uses won't necessarily change over time? Oh, yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah, I mean, if you've followed the Fair Start for Kids Act, you know that this is going to be an extreme, a dramatic uh, advancement in uh, the expansion of affordable uh, early learning and child care uh, for, for families and children in Washington State. So the reason we are able to do that is because of the funds that are coming in from a, a number of sources, but particularly from capital gains. And so um, they, they, they are connected. I mean, that's, we are bringing in revenue from a source and doing a significant advancement uh, in investment and resources. Uh, so, so they are connected. And I think the, the sort of, if you're asking for sort of the proof of that, I think the proof of that is in the budget. It's in the budget that we already passed. You know, oh, and that was something I meant to mention at the beginning, thinking about, you know, the budgets that are coming out. Um, you know, these budgets have been seen, right? And so I can just tell you based on the Senate budget and the House budget, there's capital gains assumed in there and there's major investments. And I think you're likely to see a final budget. It's gonna be a, a melding of the two uh, budgets. So anything that was in both budgets is likely to be in the final budget. And I did want to touch on the um, timing of the budget because that was a question when we had our bit availability last time and just be super clear on what the process is. Uh, we have a uh, rule in the Senate and then there's a joint rule that uh, any conference report uh, has to be uh, on the bar for more than 24 hours. So there was a question about, will there be more than a few hours? Absolutely, it'll be more than 24 hours. Hopefully it'll be even more than that. We are just waiting for the code advisor and, the, and the, uh, the last loose ends to be tied up and for the actual bill to be uh, ready to go. And when it is, it will be released. Uh, it won't be later than, than 24 hours before we vote on it, but uh, hopefully it'll be earlier than, than that. And again, these are budgets that have been out since March. It's not gonna be, uh, it's, it's important that everybody gets to see it, um, but they, it's gonna be a melding of two budgets that have been well vetted uh, over the last few months. Laurel, do you have a follow? Uh, I guess just on that, that last point, so is it still looking like potentially Saturdays when we get that budget or could it be uh, Friday, tomorrow? Do you have any sense yet? Our staff has, has told us that it'll that Saturday morning is is the the target to not be later than that. If it comes out sooner, then it'll be will it'll be released really sooner. But um, that's 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 the target is Saturday morning. Okay, up next we'll go to Essex Porter with Cairo TV. Essex, go ahead. Yes, thank you. I, I wanted to talk a bit about the police reform legislation. Uh, we were hearing from Republicans this morning uh, who called the solutions very partisan and said that they undercut the ability of law enforcement to keep themselves and the public safe. Do the reforms go too far? Oh, I can take that out. Yeah, yeah um, I, I don't believe the reforms go too far at all. Um, I was actually very excited that the bill, that my bill on uh, duty to intervene yesterday was bipartisan. Uh, we even had um, two of the law enforcement um, uh, organizations support the bill as it was going through. All the police accountability bills that um, went through both chambers, work had started on it over the summer. There's been a long period of time where we have heard from everyone involved and um, they don't go too far because they are tailored to address the problems that we have seen in our own communities. These are not hypothetical problems that we're trying to solve. These are problems that have been identified. We have seen those problems occurring in real life in our own communities, and these are the solutions to it. Change always makes people nervous, but this is change for the better. This is change that is going to result in more trust being created among law enforcement and the communities in which they serve. 
And we've already seen, especially the, um, the intervention program already up and running in our criminal justice training um, uh, commission. We have seen uh, law enforcement changing and really adopting that culture of being a guardian and not a warrior. And we have seen police agencies who are doing the right thing. And so there are examples and models that can be followed in our own state. And this is simply about accountability and about transparency. And I think we're going to see the results of the incredible work we have done this session in the next few years to come. Essex, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, it, it looked like uh, Senator Saldana wanted to add something as well. And, and, and as you do, Senator, would this be happening at all uh, without what has happened to George Floyd, uh, what has happened to Manuel Ellis, and uh, your thoughts on the verdict uh, in, the, in the Chauvin case? Yeah, thank you so much. And I mean, definitely just my initial answer was no, I do not think they go too far enough uh, or, or, uh, and that we have more work to do. Um, it, it would not be happening if it wasn't for the martyrdom of George Floyd and for the young woman who was brave enough to hold her video camera up. And when it was so painful, when so many people were asking for him to get off his neck. Um, and, you know, this last few weeks has been, uh, I know for so many, um, really intense, uh, stressful, um, everyone on, on, um, on the edges of their seats. And I know that yesterday was a moment where so many people were able to sigh a moment of relief. Um, it was not justice. Um, it was uh, accountability. Um, as Senator Dinger spoke to. And it reminds us how important and how it is, it should not be rare that um, when a uh, officer sees another officer going too far um, and, not, uh, um, and not following the code uh, that um, they speak up and that they're supported to be able to speak up. Um, and so I think what we're seeing is this set of um, police reforms that we're moving forward are just a step to be able to support our law enforcement and our communities to be safer. Um, because it is, is important um, that we also pass um, the, the gun reform legislation this year. Because it's hard on our law enforcement, on our National Guard, when they're going to peaceful protests um, and there's people open carrying. Um, it uh, makes us all less safe when we cannot um, when we cannot act out our First Amendment rights um, to protest peacefully, to speak up, to know that we can be able to um, be heard without um, having to fear for our lives. And so I'm just very grateful um, for all the courageous folks um, that helped make the verdict yesterday possible. And, um, and I know that um, there is so much reform that needs to happen, um, but I'm very um, proud of the leadership. And I think it's important to recognize, um, you know, I serve as the co-chair of um, the Members of Color Caucus, um, where um, we have a new member, Senator Nobles. Um, she also is part of our Black Caucus um, as the only senator um, that's part of that caucus, um, but that many of the pieces of legislation that we moved were moved by um, members um, of both the Black Caucus and our members of the Color Caucus. Um, and so that it wouldn't happen if we didn't have this kind of representation um, with the most diverse um, legislative body um, this year. Sorry, I kind of cut you off. Essex, do you have another follow-up? Uh, no, no, thank you. Okay. I just wanted to add to that, um, Essex, is that I agree with uh, Senator Saldana that had it not been for that video, we wouldn't be here today. I, brown and black families have been telling us for decades that this is going on, that people were not believing them. I also think that COVID had a lot to do with it because people were home and they were paying attention because they didn't have the new Hollywood movie to go see or new TV shows to watch. They were actually watching and paying attention. And um, I've said this before so many times that when you have uh, marches uh, for Black Lives in Woodenville, in Duval, in Redmond, you know that everyone 
wants to see these accountability measures. This is not just something that a few people want. This is universal at this point in time. We saw these marches all across the world, not even just in the United States. So this is a fundamental historic problem that we have had as a country when it comes to racism. And so this is a very important step, but we would, we would not be here if it wasn't for George Floyd. And yeah. it's very important to acknowledge that. Yeah, and I wanted to thank Senator Dinger and Senator Saldana for their leadership. Uh, you know, I think our state, our caucus, our legislature has come a long way in looking at issues of racial justice and police reform. Senator Dinger has been such a leader on the police reform uh, uh, work, especially, and it, it's important. I mean, it's one of the things I love about having a citizen legislature. Is she's a prosecutor. She's a member of law enforcement, and she's here leading the effort uh, on, on accountability, and we have uh, not only uh, the most diverse legislature ever, uh, the, the most diverse Senate Democratic Caucus, the, I think one of the most diverse leadership teams in the history uh, of uh, certainly our state, but even uh, throughout the country, one of the most diverse leadership teams. And the result of that is, is that we're making progress and we're not there. But when we look at what we've done, uh, both on the police accountability bills, but also in terms of all of the diversity, equity and inclusion work that we've done in it, healthcare and education, uh, throughout the criminal justice system, um, it's a big step forward. Um, it's a step in, in, a, in a longer journey, um, but I, I'm proud of the work that we've done to this point. Thank you all. Next, we'll go to Jerry Cornfield with the Everett Herald. Jerry, go ahead. First, uh, I'm hoping you can clarify something you said, Senator Billig, and, uh, on the, and a question on the budget. First, did you... Um, if I understood right, it sounds like you guys have reached agreement. You're just waiting for the sentences to be written up. But if the handshakes happened on the budget, and what is the status of one of the financing tools to deal the document recording fee that has not cleared the chambers? What's the status? Yeah, in terms of the final final agreement, I the budget uh, leads uh, last I talked to were still tying up just a few loose ends. Uh, but they had worked through the big stuff and then mostly the work that going on was the technical work. Um, and, uh, and then the document recording fee is uh, House Bill 1277, uh, I think is, is the number. It is on the Senate floor calendar and we are working through uh, the vote count and we still have a couple more days to do that. But that's uh, it's a bill we would like to pass and just need to make sure that we've got the votes to do that. Gary, do you have a follow-up? Uh, yes, please. Uh, an update uh, maybe it's for Senator Saldana. The, why did the transportation package die, and does that now endanger the passage of a cap and trade uh, for which it was linked and now isn't? Oh, well, I mean, so the transportation package, we moved it out of um, the committee with a due pass recommendation. So it's in rules right now. Um, and unfortunately, it, it left our um, committee. Um, not in the traditional fashion of bipartisan. Um, we had, um, 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 you know, mostly Democratic um, votes, but we did have enough votes to get it on. So it's not dead. Uh, it is very much alive. Uh, I know that Chair Hobbs and uh, Chair Fai are really close to concurrence on the current um, um, budget for the next biennium. That has been really um, taking a lot of time this year, uh, more than we had hoped, um, in part because unlike the operating and the transportation budget reflects a lot more of budgets of regular Washingtonians um, where it's down. Um, and the only thing that's keeping our um, people housed and keeping them being able to pay some of their bills is federal stimulus. And similar, because of some federal dollars, we're able to, to figure our way forward to make sure that we're keeping projects going, that we're able to continue to make our commitments around the culverts. Um, but if it wasn't for the federal stimulus, um, you know, we were already having difficulties because we know we have a declining um, gas um, revenue and so much of our transportation depends on that. 
um, where we are right now with um, the transportation package is similar um, caucusing um, with our colleagues, getting them up to speed on the revenues, figuring out a way if we can um, get the votes so that you know the, the proposal that uh, that came out of committee was with bonds, um, which requires you know a few more votes. And so I think we're, we're working through that. Um, there's a strong commitment to want to get to a package. Um, from um, all of um, the folks that also want us to take action on climate um, and make sure that we um, build a transportation uh, recovery that is green, green, clean, and equitable. And, um, and so I think you, you, see, you see that still in the works. Um, and I think part of what we're making sure is that uh, especially as we're hearing more from the federal government about their willingness to be partners in infrastructure um, and recovery and making sure that we position Washington state to um, be able to fully leverage um, anything that um, starts shaking out of the federal way. So uh, we're still working through um, the two bills are in the house. Um, they're making um, changes on climate commitment and clean fuels um, as it came out of uh, appropriate and so we're hoping that we can um, still seal that deal in the next few days. Um, so still working hard um, on, on that package. That's the end of our uh, questions. So I'll turn it back over to the members for some closing remarks. I'll, I'll just say thank you, appreciate it. I know there's a lot going on today. Uh, we've got, I think, a, a exciting few days to uh, wrap up um, uh, uh, extremely successful legislative session. Looking forward to that work and uh, hopefully talking with all of you around Sine Die. Uh, Senator Saldana, Senator Dingra. No, just thank you guys so much and let's see if um, House can get that capital gains back over to us. And I'll just add, this truly has been a historic transformative session. Um, the, the resources and the help that we're providing families, small businesses, our children, taking a look at equity, uh, police um, accountability, criminal justice reform, um, this session truly is one that I think will go down in history as one where we have changed the lives of individuals for the better, and I've been very excited to be part of it. Thank you. Great. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for sticking with us all year. We'll uh, send out some, some notices later on. I'm sure we'll We'll check in as we get closer to the end here. So thanks a lot. Thank you.